Welcome to the Future of Tourism podcast. I'm David Peacock. Stop owning your own content. Young leaders are stepping up. Bring everyone to the table. And imagine their world anew. If you've been watching the rise of narrative-based generative AI, then I assume you're as conflicted and confused as to the long-term outcomes of this magnificent leap in computing as I am. I don't want to be dramatic, but when the headline in the Globe and Mail in May reads, the godfather of AI has some regrets, and we aren't even out of the starting blocks yet, well, yeah, man, what to make of that? We have a technology that we know is immensely powerful and can, in theory, be limitlessly scaled, but we are only at the beginning of grasping how to use it and how to make it work for humans. AI has been around since the 1950s and earlier. It exists in various forms all around us. The last five years have seen a massive leap in the general public's awareness of AI, thanks in part to the cool and popular attractiveness of language-based AI like ChatGPT. Jeanette Roosh is EVP Marketing and Digital at New York City Tourisms and Conventions. She spent more than two decades with industry-leading organizations such as Broadway.com and with various modern media agencies. Paul McLeod is a maverick in the data space. He's the director of analytics at SimpleView and runs the internal think tank known as the Insight Groups. Good morning, Jeanette. Good morning, Paul. You first, Jeanette. How are you? Where are you? What's it like? Uh, I'm in Long Island City, New York, and it's a beautiful, clear, hot, sunny day. Mm, hot, sunny. Surprise, surprise. Mm-hmm. Paul McLeod, um, is it hot where you are? <laughs> yes, I am in Tucson. Uh, actually, today is supposed to be our nicest day in like a month plus. Uh, it's supposed to rain a lot in a couple hours, but we'll see. What's they never really know whether it's going to happen during monsoon season. What's temperature like there? Oh, well, right now it's 93, which is cool. It's usually well over 100 by now. Uh... <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, a big thing in the news recently, Phoenix, six weeks of 105 plus temperatures. Yeah, uh, Phoenix is hotter than Tucson by a few degrees. They're lower down. So um, don't move there is my advice. Uh, no, we won't. Well, it, no, <laughs> and, and, and it still is the fastest expanding county in the United States of America. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um. You know that saying, um, "The future's here." It's just not evenly distributed. We're in, we're all in Dallas a couple of weeks ago, looking at Phoenix. These are cities they're going to learn how to deal with with absolute heat um, frustration, and they're going to have oh, yeah. to do it quickly. I, I was reading articles in the in the New York Times and the Globe, you know, about going back to painting buildings white and using sort of you know uh, pre like early early history history from the 16 from the 600s and 700s in her in terms of how to deal with heat we're going to we're going to run the cusp of having to do that over and over aren't we oh yeah tucson i mean uh yeah i have a tight thick titanium white paint coat on the roof of the building i'm in right now everybody everybody does it pretty much uh, okay so the reason i've called you both here dearly beloved we're gathered here today because we had a fantastic discussion at the ttra in St. Louis. And if anybody doesn't know the Tourism Travel Research Association, it's an event worth going to. I think it opens your minds, it cross pollinates us with what we're asking research to do. But what I got a real sense of what research is capable of too, when you unfetter it and you let it start thinking about the problems that that we don't know we don't know about. So let's let's have a chat again. Let's have a chat about the positive and negative implications of AI. Jeanette, as I said earlier, You've got a great way of walking people through a really um, uh, um, non-threatening way to look at AI. And you do that I'm, I'm part because we're all threatened by it. Paul, you have a great view of the long-term potential of it, some really great anecdotes, some funny ones. So let's start with this. Jeanette, what is AI to you? Uh, so I look at AI specifically in the realm of something like chat GPT as generative AI, with generative meaning it's generating content. So the way that we see this now is primarily words, right? Written content, but it can also generate data analyses. Uh, Other, not chat GPT at this moment, but other versions of generative AI can generate photos and videos. So that's all of the things that can be kind of encompassed by this technology. And it all happens through an algorithm. So it's really, it is, 
a math program, a computer program that is looking to find patterns and data. And one of those data points is words and how people form words into sentences. And it turns out, you know, of course, we all like to think of how unique we are, but words and sentences follow predictable patterns. And essentially what OpenAI has done with ChatGPT and the underlying models, which are GPT-3.5, GPT-4, is that they've unlocked what order do words go in to make sentences so that it can generate new sentences on its own based on our prompting. Okay, so it's fair to say then that right now your your central focus is on language-based generative AI. That's correct. But you, but I know you you have a, a broad um, sense of its history, though. You've seen AI in its iterative forms come through machine learning and, and vision learning and things like that. Okay, Paul, context for you. You you work every day in data mm-hmm. at SimpleView. You also you run the insights group, which takes data to a new level by by literally trying to find out the things we don't know we don't know. What's AI to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I really like Jeanette's uh, description of the type of AI that everybody has been uh, hot to talk about lately for the past, uh, th- you know, eight months, nine months. That's when I feel like it came up. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Generative AI or um, uh, large language models is another term that gets used for the language versions of them. Um, uh, these AI uh, deep learning uh, neural networks that rely on uh, the new technique, if you want to get even a little bit more technical and more technical than I can fully explain, uh, of transformers, which sort of um, is an algorithm that allows the the language AI to sort of understand the way the words in your sentence uh, work together to form concepts. So, you know, for instance, if you, um, you know, we have lots of words in English that mean totally different things depending on the context. So that's how they've sort of gotten to where the the, the thing is way better uh than it had been and i think that's why also jeanette's focusing on that because that's the big advance that has gotten all the news and everybody excited and has all these new business applications um that uh really really expand the ability of or are going to i think they're doing it now but we're going to see it filtering into our lives more and more over the next like i don't know 18 to 24 months um uh of you know actual tools that just allow the parsing and understanding of language and text a lot better and also if you're in a more visual field you know um, i can imagine designers are going to be doing a lot of drafting uh with uh ai generating um uh, uh image generating ais um in the near future so those sorts of things i think are what uh just those generative tools like jeanette said are the most exciting things right now and they're also the things that are exciting because or not ex- well exciting in a weird way um uh they get people excited uh in the sense that um these are the things that seem human enough almost that they've gotten all these people talking about you know are we being replaced are these things going to develop their own agenda and kill us all um and you know is is humanity obsolete because of these things and that's also i think why the focusing on the generative ais makes sense as you as you allude to though yeah ai is a very broad term that just refers to the concept of a machine sort of thinking for itself um and this can certainly be an advance towards the concept that i think everybody is sort of gesturing towards which is general ai as it's called or um you know where the machine just is a brain that thinks for itself and i don't think we're even close to there yet to give away the ending um, but this is like the first thing in a while that feels like a tangible uh, step towards that goal, if you will, or at least uh, eventuality. Okay, we're going to come back to the technology of this. You gave a great analogy when we were in St. Louis about AI being completely tethered to the number of computations you can make in a second, essentially. Mm-hmm. And, and really what we're talking about is a technology that's already so good at being predictive when it comes to sentences, it will be 10 times better in, in three years. If we, if we use Moore's law, it'll be phenomenally good at predicting what, what literally what we say next or what to say next. Is that fair to say? At, what the average person would say next is how I would put it, or what would typically most typically be said next. Let me put it that way. <laughs> well, well, yeah. but, okay. I, I would say like the last bit, of the, I, my understanding of how the transformers work, it's that it's almost like when you compress a photo and text it to someone and then it re 
or uncompresses, you know, to use the technical term, sure. uh, that it's the same thing with the algorithms, that it somehow compresses them so it takes less compute, less computational power to work with, and then it expands okay. later. So, so we won't get all geeky on that, but we will tell people that's what drove streaming video on the internet. There was this supposition that we'd need literally a megabit per second to stream television quality video, we're now down to something like 230 kilobytes. So the compression is just as important as the speed of the computation. Yeah. Which gives us a which gives us a curve actually faster than Moore's law in that case then. Because mm -hmm. it's 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 increased computing power and compression at the same time. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So let's talk about practical applications. Then we'll talk about Elon Musk. I had to spend about <laughs> 45 minutes listening to him talk about AI last night. It was very interesting. Um fascinating and inarticulate would be how i describe it <laughs> and i don't mean that in a pejorative way it just it really a lot of leaps of thinking okay inarticulate so, in a nice way I've got yeah it. so he, he, he's what ai is not going to predict what elon musk says next to your, <laughs> to your point no, exactly yeah, yeah okay depending so, on the temperature if you change the temperature yeah. of your model it could be anything there it is so, there there it is totally okay jeanette um i saw you speak in sofia bulgaria back in the fall i guess it was was this no, was this no spring? it was April. Oh my gosh, time flies. Yeah, I know. Okay. Um, you did a great job of sort of framing the discussion we kind of just had, which was a lot of fun. Thanks for that, both of you. But you but then you took it into something really practical. Said, look, let's start with some practical looks at AI. And you gave some examples. Can you just give us a little recap of that and, and share some of your insights about how you use it, how it's practical, how not to discount it, and how to actually make it work for you as a tool? Uh, so I typically, you can think of it in terms of buckets of tasks. So when I'm using it for content creation, it's not, hey, write this blog post for me or write a LinkedIn post for me. It's going to be more, here is, you know, like even when I was assembling the speech for Sophia, it's here is, you know, two pages of all of the thoughts I've just been collecting about how to use, you know, chat GPT please put this in an order for me. Like take, take the madness and the chaos and put some structure around it because it's always, as an algorithm, it is always looking for structure. So, so when, you, you, when you start, you don't start with a blank sheet and say, tell me who's the best uh, AI expert in tourism then. Because I did, I did, and your name didn't come up, just so you know. <laughs> oh, you know that it cut off from the internet as of October 21. That's fine. Oh, yeah, there it is, there it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, but, but seriously, but you generally do feed in your content. It's not a, so I did use a couple of mm -hmm. times this morning. I asked it to write some great intros for two leading um, AI thinkers and it, I won't read them to you. You don't sound very good on these. Um, <laughs> and, and then and it made up some people. The funny thing is it actually made up a couple of professors as well. And I went to look at them and they're real professors. It's just their field isn't what chat GPT reported said they were to travel and tourism AI specific experts. They're not, they're ethicists and they're com computational and somehow it, it shoehorned in the fact that they were, I think maybe at one point they spoke in a conference somewhere far away and GPT decided that was tourism. There you go. All right. I, I like to give it the content first rather than letting it take a stab in the dark, because remember it's a large language model. It is yeah. not a large knowledge model. So it is not going to go to Wikipedia and fact check the things that you ask of it. So yeah. if there's something I would like to be factual, I paste it in first. Mm -hmm. So I've used it for uh, like putting together what is our strategy going to be around celebrating the semi-quincentennial for the country. Mm -hmm. And rather than saying, tell me about people who might be interested in historical tourism who come to New York City, I found research online, you know, secondary research talking about people who travel, you know, because they're history buffs. And then I pasted that in bit by bit because the context window at ChatGPT isn't large enough for huge papers yet, but it can summarize them in sections. I'm like, please read this and pull out all of the information that would be relevant to the tourism board for New York City as mm. they prepare, as they go on this journey. And then I use that to say, great, write the SWOT analysis, you know, let's build out what these audiences look like and how we describe them. And this is something I stole from Miles, actually, Miles Partnership. It's like, are you familiar with experience mosaic profiles? Tell mm -hmm. me which profiles apply to each of these audience segments. But I find starting from facts makes that an easier process. 
that that makes a lot of sense, Paul. You have a couple examples when we were when we were in St. Louis um, of of using it for you know work purposes and a couple of strange examples. I think you told a great example about uh, a lawyer who prepared a case yeah. using. Yeah, maybe can you recap that one and then just tell us your thoughts on it as a working tool? Yeah, I mean, it did a lot of it. it uh, hallucinated is the term people have been used for this. Uh, that you in the way that you described earlier with your um, uh, AI experts prompt for it. Um, yeah, some guy, uh, a lawyer uh, whose client was, I think he was, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was the lawyer for the cl- uh, the plaintiff and not the airline, but I could have that backwards. Anyway, somebody was suing an airline for a personal injury. Um, one of the lawyers submitted a, br- a 10-page brief um, arguing for some position in his case, some motion or other, um, and that had a bunch of references to cases, you know, with all with names like... Uh, you know, Gonzalez versus Korea Airlines, you know, last name versus airline name um, that all seemed fairly plausible. And uh, he turned it in and the opposite uh, opposition counsel, um, you know, went about trying to respond to it. And they came back and said, hey, uh, we can't we can't find any of these cases, man. Um, what's going on? And it turned out he had had chat GPT write the entire thing for him. That's and right. uh, had not double checked any of the uh, any of the cases in it, and the judge was uh, displeased by this. Um, I think maybe somebody in the crowd, as I was telling the story, it might have been you, Jeanette. Uh, it was. Yeah, yeah <laughs> uh, mentioned that he apparently was distrustful enough to ask Chat GPT whether Chat GPT was messing with him or not, and Chat GPT assured him, like, "Yeah, no, this is all real, buddy." I know exactly what I'm talking about. And of course, you know, this just happens, though, did the deeper point being um, because it knows it's smart enough to know what a legal brief looks like. It's smart enough to construct a sort of like basic logical argument. Um, and it's smart enough to know that in a legal brief, you need to cite some cases. And it even it's uh, it says, you know, hey, if I know about some cases, yeah, I would probably use some real ones. But if I don't, then well, that's fine. Uh, you just, as far as I can tell as an AI, Come on, this is, this um, you is just great. need to have a last name versus an airline and put that there and that's good enough. Okay. Um, but this is grade seven, right? Grade seven. Yeah. When you, when your geography teacher says to you, this is the first essay you've ever written. You're in yeah. grade school. Now you're not a child and trust me, I will check all your facts. So don't try and pull one over me. I think half the class tried to pull one on over. Right? Yeah, probably. Okay. So we're, we're back there. So the basic lessons are. You can trust it as far as you can throw it. You can structure it well if you structure it well, and you take it with a grain of salt. Is that fair? Totally. Uh, yeah. Do we now assume like like um, you know hydrogenated palm oil that it's just in everything and we don't even notice it anymore, or what? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, like uh, uh, Jeanette's example. I mean, uh, especially when you're using it that way, when you're uh, sort of taking it as a draft and then uh, you know refining it into something that's actually good and that actually you know uh reflects human thought um in that sense yeah you've seen it in a ton of things um certainly you know lots of emails you get um even you know uh lots of text messages you get now that you're all the text message apps are trying to suggest what people are uh gonna send back and forth i turned that off on my phone it's been there for years even before chat gpt was really a thing um, but I'm sure lots of people use it to just send a quick, you know, uh, you know, predictive whatever the responses. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and it makes up some really bad words when you do that sometimes, like just mm-hmm. the most inappropriate words if you don't check your predictive <laughs> type. Yeah, we've all been there. Well, the older you are, the more you've been there. That might be your algorithm, David, being a little poisoned. I don't know. <laughs> right, maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe that is it. Yeah. Okay. Did either of you see the city of Boston actually released a set of guidelines for city employees to use generative AI at work? No. Oh, really? No. What did they say? Hey, well, I mean, it's fantastic. So the chief technology officer, I think, for the city, like they emailed it to every single city employee and then they created a website for it. They created guidelines they wanted folks to follow. Those are publicly available for anybody to read. And it's like very encouraging, like, you know, a cheerleader. But they have a note in there where they say, you're still responsible for the output of these systems, just Again. like with, with autocorrect. If you send yeah. an email and autocorrect changes the meaning of a word, it doesn't, you know, yeah. change your obligation as the sender of the email to make sure that everything is right. That, that's 100%. a really good point. Do you think we're going to see more of sort of the instructional side of that? Will schools start to really push 
that ethos. Um, you know, we, we, we went to school. I, I don't know about you guys. I went to school. I had a computer in 1982. That was a big deal. Like it was a huge deal. Now I've watched kids sit in class with two computers, one for lecture notes, one for typing. And it's unbelievable. Like just unbelievable. Do you think it'll become part of media literacy? Cause you know, we look at our Gen Z's and the good news is my, my Gen Z daughter says, don't worry, dad, I don't believe anything. It's like, oh, well, I'm not sure I'm warmed by that, but I'm, I'm maybe maybe a little satiated. But geez, <laughs> um, certainly you're going to see. Uh, I think people learning how to incorporate this into just as a tool. I mean, the same way, um, you know, uh, people use their laptops in class now, and that I'm sure, uh, you know, like I lived in a time before laptops were quite in the classroom in front of everybody. Um, I live, I, you know, I, I, uh, I was educated. You're saying you're old, Paul. Just so <laughs> I know. It was almost 20 years ago. Yeah. Nobody, people had laptops, but generally not in the classroom. Um, I was actually always noted for like, I would play a snake on my cell phone, like my candy bar, Nokia cell phone uh, during lectures. Cause like, I'm just like too, I, it helps me pay attention if I'm just doing something mindless with my thumbs. Um, but some people were always like, are you just playing games the whole time? I'm like, no, I'm listening. But I seriously played a lot of Snake on there. Anyway, um, so uh, laptops, uh, you know, have become into the classroom and people have sort of gotten over what I'm sure were some major ethical concerns about uh, what people could be looking up or doing with uh, phones and laptops. And sure. I think, uh, yeah, they're going to figure out how to work generate AI generated content into the ethical frameworks of uh, original content and plagiarism and learning and that kind yeah. of thing, I think, because it's uh this is not going to be something that's stoppable um you know yeah. people are just going to do it so it, you're going to have to learn how to live with it is my view Jeanette you come up through a world of uh, media companies you worked at broadway.com at one point um your you know your, your ability to be articulate is a key part of your your strength as an executive that's what that's I think is a really fair statement but when you when you look at this and you look at where it's going and you look at your peers do you ever find bad examples of it or people where you just got to say, don't use it that way, or, or maybe try and use it this way a little more. So I actually, I teach in the spring semester of arts marketing class at Hunter College. And so this is, you know, the class started the end of January when this was still very, very new, but I was already very interested in it. And so I'm like, everybody, we need to all figure out how to use this together for class. And so there was a lot of because the class is, you know, it's kind of marketing 101. Everybody mm -hmm. picks a project that they are building on for the semester, and then they have a marketing plan that they present at the end of the semester. And yes, there were students where I'm like, you know, the one, there, there was one student in particular maybe struggled a little bit more than the rest of the class. I'm like, nope, even you, even you should use chat GPT to help you with things. Nice, nice. And then you, you can tell, when you know it was very obvious it you didn't end obvious. up with 30 essays that said the four p's of marketing are consistently <laughs> no that's the great thing about and so i mean and this is part of what teachers will have to do is that you can't the cookie cutter style assignments aren't going to work anymore if it's please just write a report on the four p's of marketing but right. if it's apply the four p's of marketing to the photo exhibition that you want to do at the Museum of the City of New York in 2025, mm. then at a minimum, even if ChatGPT is doing everything, they're learning how to use it in a way that is applied to a real project, just like I do in my job for New York City Tourism wow. Conventions. What a, what a different skill set. Hey, you graduate and your new skill set is the ability to discern whether the generative text you've been given is actually useful. Yeah. Right, which is where it should be, just like with the calculator, right? Like right. you want to, it's less important to me that I can multiply 11 by 11 and more that I know what to do with the result of that if I'm looking for it. Yeah, that I that's a great analogy, I think. Because, um, yeah, I'm sure plenty of, uh, of people will howl at this notion, but, and I love writing and everything, but yeah. Uh, this is just going to be how people do stuff. So as a teacher, if you're getting people, if you're getting your students to practice a real skill that they will use. That's the point, not, you know, teaching them how to type a bunch of uh, characters into a word processor. Right. You know? I want them to see what strategy looks like and how it applies in different executions. And as long as they're understanding that and able to say it to me in the presentation at the end of class, 
I don't care how they got there. Yeah. So that's a really great example, though, of sort of basics to using AI. You've got all your students. They're learning that, you know, at a post-secondary level, and they're in their 20s and 30s. It's all the adults who haven't learned it that worry me. <laughs> no process. Yeah, 100%. Action. I tell my kids, like, I, so I've got a 15-year-old. You know, I think he should absolutely be learning how to use this for practical purposes, like Jeanette and you were talking about. Um I think that's, you know, one of the most useful things he probably could do as far as preparing for professional skills, you know, that he'll need in the next decade. Mm -hmm. um, so 100%. Yeah. Well, I mean, and we used to say, you know, we send people to school to learn skills, but we also send them to learn that they can learn anything. And mm -hmm. and this is an extension of that here. Here's this powerful new tool. Learn, learn more than we've done with it. Progress with it. I, I get that point. Okay. So we've talked about applications and Jeanette, you've clearly said, and Paul, you backed it up. It's not that tourism has a special application for AI. It does. It can write wonderfully um, demonstrative paragraphs that capture, you know, that, that are eloquently written and stuff, but it still starts with data. So we're saying, Jeanette, you're saying use AI the same way you'd use a blender. You don't take your blender in your car. You don't take your AI into the boardroom, so, so to speak. That's great. So talk to me about the doom and gloom side of it because i'm you know i'm watching jeffrey Hinton and he's a big deal up here he spends half his time in canada as you know on, on the google file but then i'm watching musk last night it was i wasn't even watching my wife was watching and i came over and just sort of looked over her shoulder and i forgot that he was one of the founders of open ai and and you know I'm, I'm i'm used to sort of grassing you know leaning on him and being a bit of a grinder on him but here's the point he did point out that he did it because he was concerned at the time. Now, this is his stated fact that Google had a monopoly on all the AI brains in the world, that they were literally buying it up as fast as they could. And he worried that it would progress elsewhere. But he said he was very specific about making open AI a not-for-profit, which it no longer is, is it? No, I guess not. Uh, no, yeah. it's not. Well, it was certainly yeah. sold to Microsoft. So, yeah. no. Um, yeah, I mean, don't trust the... Well, yeah. Uh, so, okay, good. I'm happy that there's a pregnant pause here because that's how I feel all the time. It's like, ah, so go ahead. Uh, so the dissenting view, which I can't even take credit for. I haven't seen the Oppenheimer film yet, but some months ago, one of the newsletters that I read uh, quoted John von Neumann. I don't know if he is a character that shows up in Oppenheimer or not. So after, after the show, we should look that up. Yeah. But, uh, at the point, there was some point when Robert Oppenheimer said that the physicists involved in the Manhattan Project had known sin. And John von Neumann said, some people confess guilt to take credit for the sin. So the <laughs> idea, right? It's like, wow. oh, maybe yes. he protests a little too much. Yeah, no, uh, and as another, other people I've heard have put it, um, these uh, these dire warnings about the future of AI uh, do sort of amount to um, a bunch of computer guys with a lot of uh, stake in the uh, computer game saying, oh, no, our computers are too good, everybody. Um, <laughs> they're so good, we can't even control them anymore. Um, so, um, And that's, I think, a little bit of it. And also just like, uh, this has been a, a sort of a fantasy slash dark prophecy of... Um, computer enthusiasts uh, for, uh, I mean, maybe approaching a century, um, mm -hmm. but certainly since computers started to get really big in like the 50s, um, the days of Asimov, certainly. Um, so uh, it's also just sort of like a meme. that. Keeps them so, so do you think when Vladimir Putin says, remember we did that little quiz at TTRA yeah. from the New York Times, one of the quotes was, whoever controls this technology will will go forward to rule the world. You know, was it was it nuclear uh power was it ai and it was it was putin about three years ago talking about ai is he just another uninformed or what, what do you take of that i mean i think that misdescribes the dynamic just because i don't think there will be one c country that controls ai so it won't be the deciding factor in that sense um also i mean i think it's powerful it's obviously powerful it's going to generate a lot of text and help us understand a lot of things it can do things now like uh translate cuneiform uh, tech tablets that there are tens of thousands of them that we have, but nobody who knows cuneiform right. has the time to go back and translate them all. So that's significant. That's a somewhat academic, but uh, example of the sort of thing it can do. 
that we just didn't have access to anymore. It's certainly powerful. I just am not, when people worry about apocalypse scenarios, they're worried about, you know, self-aware AI with its own agenda connected to too many things that it can use to destroy. Well, the world. and that, that worries me because that's a bit of a red herring because we, we just keep thinking, well, the world's got, world's going to play out like a, a blockbuster Hollywood movie. It's not, it never does. Yeah. So Jeanette, we were just talking about this. We were, we we're both in Texas for quite a period of time and it's incredibly hot. I mean, the day of AIs controlling power grids and the heat distribution, those things are coming. What worries me more, and I keep hitting on this thing, you know, we, we know what we know and we have an idea of what we don't know, but what really generally bites us in the Aristotle as human beings is what we don't know. We don't know. So what happens when an AI starts to look at, you know, electricity patterns starts to modulate temperature to meet, meet a directive of saving money. And then, and at the other end of that equation is lives, but they don't figure into it. I mean, are we, are we heading for that? Cause I don't see sentient machines leaving, you know, leaving their computational ground and taking over NORAD, although I guess it's theoretically possible. It's more the subtle things in there that, you know, change something by a few degrees or open a, open a shelter later because the bus stopped coming and all of a sudden people get affected. And that's the part that, that's the part that worries me about the AIs. I think that Gregory Hinton, his, like the, the basis of his nervousness around AI is around warfare. So just like think about how drone technology has utterly changed warfare like this in the same way has the same capacity. And you have to know that there are people working on that and thinking about that because there's so much money in it. Right. And that's not something, you know, that open AI is, you know, tweeting about. So we well, don't hear it. It's not part of the conversation that we have. But I think that my understanding is that when he's nervous about AI, it's about bad actors okay, or so entire countries. Let's let's riff on that though, because DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project in America that funds all sorts of research in every post-secondary education institution, including MIT in a big way. Um, you know. A decade ago, they said the next decade is the power of the narrative. So isn't it interesting that as generative AI comes into its own, the thing that that, that they've been saying since, since the first Gulf War is the power of the narrative is more powerful than any weapon. And we're certainly seeing that in the disinformation wars. We've certainly seen it in... I, I think I can think of three instances, the American elections, the Canadian elections, and, and Brexit. We know that, you know that trolls and chatbots were at play. We know that those are... AI technology. So now it's not the technology, it's it's the use of it in in a in a nefarious way to control a narrative, to, to literally create a narrative. That's the part, I guess, that that that's worrying. That that's the weaponization of it in some sense, even though it doesn't involve drones and weapons, right? Yeah. And, I, and it's scary. I have no answer for it. <laughs> no, all right. Well, for me, I mean, I agree. Uh, absolutely. Uh, using You could use this to support your, you know, digital marketing campaign to disinform the public about this or that uh, thing. In that sense, could be very useful to spammers. And I think that's one of the things I do see it definitely being uh, being good at is generating useless uh or you okay know, just, hang on we're we're gonna we're gonna we're actually gonna get mcleod's oh, law here okay I'm well sure. okay, we're, we're gonna let him do it let's do it come on give well it. we don't have to do that right now no we do we have me, to do we have to do okay it. well let, let me make this point though um uh i agree absolutely what you're saying that for di po uh propaganda disinformation whatever could be useful but it's more of a a new tool in the arsenal in that sense and not like a huge game changer i think because like these things i mean that's been around for millennia um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, we were, we, both sides in w the world wars were dropping flyers on the, uh, opposition lines. Um, the Germans, uh, used to, or no, sorry, the, uh, what was it? Uh, the, there used to be flyers dropped saying that, you know, while you're, oh yes, uh, dropped on the French line saying that, you know, your women behind, uh, German lines in France are, you know, uh, spending all their time with the German soldiers, um, and things like that to dispirit them. <laughs> um, so, you know, the airplane was, it was immediately put to use for disinformation. Uh, it's, point. it's Good absolutely point. a thing. Anyway. Yeah. So if you want the McLeod's law and spam, yeah. Um, in the same vein, um, uh, if you look at any 
uh, technology, and I showed some examples in my talk. Uh, if you look at your phone, if you look at your email inbox, if you look at your Instagram uh, people who are following you, if you look at your LinkedIn people who are following you, the vast majority, and if you look at your actual physical mail in your mailbox, I don't know about up in Canada, but here in the U.S., um, uh, if you, the vast majority of the things you get, the messages you get, are spam. They're just fake th people with fake messages, often trying to outright scam you, if not that, trying to get you to buy something that you may or may not actually care about. And uh, so my prediction is that, uh, yeah, um, uh, the, the McLeod's Law was as the uh, <laughs> medium of communication ages, the proportion of messages sent on it uh, devoted to spam goes to one. Um, so absolutely, one of the main things people are going to use chat GPT and its ilk for is to write spam messages and then send them to you. And then you're going to have your Gmail, your Twitter, your various platforms using uh, large language models to understand which messages are spam and try to filter them out. So it's just going to be fighting back and forth between these models. Uh, try, one trying to fool the LLMs, other LLMs trying to understand how they're being fooled to figure out uh, to, to get spam in front of you or not, as people, <laughs> whichever side wants. And that's all just mass amounts of electricity in the air. Oh, yeah. yeah. Speaking of the global warming thing, for real. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just data centers crunching numbers against each other and turning, you know, concepts into heat. Yeah. Okay. What, what, what's, what's bigger money, spam or war? Yeah. <laughs> Truly, right? Spam, Truly. actually. But it's it tough probably to say. Is. <laughs> you have a lot of people with a small stake in spam and a few people with a large stake in war. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> But wars, wars create spam, too. I think spam Absolutely. proportionally goes up in a war. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is great. We've had a discussion that's ranged from, you know, the applied to the sublime. It's a weird new technology. I called it post-nuclear because I think it is expanding so fast we can hardly think of applications. It's, it's going to be really easy to 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 watch this. I mean, it's like it's like watching a raging river in a flood. So I, my eyes on it. I, I don't know when I take my eye off it when it becomes normal for us to just say AI is in the background. I don't think in my lifetime AI is going to be just in the background. But there will come a day, right? 30 years from now when it'll be as, you know, uh, inert to us as, as driving a car or something like that. We won't think about what's on it. Thanks for shedding some light on it, making it approachable and usable, and at the same time, uh, um, illuminating some of its shortcomings. Um, I think if, if I summed it up, I'd say to both of you, you're saying the key to using AI is to be an intelligent operator, just like driving a car. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we're talking about, I think it's somewhere between seven and 900 destinations around the world. Last thoughts to each of you on, on the use of AI in life, in tourism, um, just uh, an admonition, a warning, or, you know, uh, maybe you want to pump your latest product. You first. <laughs> uh, like, get the app, keep it open on your desktop, just play with it. Just try something new every single day that you haven't used it for yet, because that is what's going to teach you the ways that it works. And then when it starts showing up in apps in you know, just kind of the air around you, it starts affecting everything. You are familiar with how it's great and you are familiar with how, you know, where the shortfalls are. Well said. Thanks. That's exactly what I was going to say pretty much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, for real. It's just a, it's a tool. Uh, the hype is uh, indicative that there's something real here, but it's also hype and a little overblown in some, at, at its wildest extremes. So like Jeanette said, uh, just get used to it. Start using it. You'll quickly find that um, as you sort of understand, uh, you know, the first your first reaction is like, oh, my God, this is so cool and amazing. This is shocking. And then as you use it more, you do see those patterns, those things that it uh, that it does over and over those errors it's prone to and that makes it both uh, that makes you better at using it and it makes the whole concept less both awe-inspiring and scary um, it turns out to be you know a, another tool we have that is very impressive but also I think you know life will continue as life uh, now that we have it. okay <laughs> listen it is a blast to talk to you both this is the most fun I've had on one of these in a long time so thanks for that um, let's keep our eye on it let's talk about it again thanks both for being here um, appreciate it.